Marguerite Guzman Bouvard, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you today. It's my pleasure too, thank you. The Invisible Wounds of War, Coming Home from Iraq and Afghanistan. And what a time to talk about this, what a relevant time. In July, the highest rate of suicides that the military has ever seen, 38 soldiers took their own lives. More casualties than in the battlefield, more than one a day. This is precisely the topic you take on in The Invisible Wounds of War. Talk about it. Well, first of all, um, only 1% of our population over 18 is in an army, and it's a volunteer army, which means they don't have enough soldiers, they're stretched thin, they're, they have too many deployments. Usually you need two years between deployments. Some of them get a year, nine months, at the most, you know, even less. So they keep going back. And they redeploy when soldiers are having um, problems with combat stress. They redeploy. You know, it's interesting. One of the trends they found is that increasingly older soldiers are taking their own lives. And we're not even talking about veterans right now. Well, I'll tell you why. Because since it's a volunteer army, since we're stretched so thin, they are calling upon the National Guard. Okay, now the National Guard, they have civilian jobs, they have children and wives, their child may be in high school. Boom, you get, instead of going once a month to do what you do and take care of the problems in the United States, you're being deployed to Afghanistan now, or were deployed to Iraq. When, and so they are less prepared for what they see. And again, would you like me to tell you something about the kind of uh, scene that they have in combat? Yes, what they face, yes. Well, they face a number of things, and one of the things that they face is that there is no front line. They don't know who the enemy is. They have no idea. And um, they may be in a crowd where people are standing together talking, and okay, they're speaking in another language, and they say one thing, and they'll tell us, we're so glad you're here to help us, and the other language is something else. And all of a sudden, boom, it's the person in the crowd, may even be a child that you'd least expect. So that's one. There's a language problem. Again, another issue of the language problem is a car drives by and a soldier on patrol says, stop. Well, do you understand stop in Arabic? No. So the car goes on. The soldier, as is required of him, shoots through the car window, opens the door, finds a woman and a couple of kids dead and starts to cry. How do you feel? Guilty? Miserable? Uh, so that's one side, is you don't know who the enemy is, where he is, because they not only have improvised explosive devices, but they have something called houseborn um, improvised explosive devices. And so you may be in a house, um, searching a house, and boom. And there's one buddy carrying another one down the stairs, dead with blood running down his back. Very stressful, very stressful. Marguerite, you talk about one young man named Noah Pierce. Noah, Noah Charles Pierce. Talk about Noah Charles Pierce's story, why you got so involved with his case. Uh, I'm a writer. I sometimes write short stories as well as poems, and um, I had a, a story in a, in a magazine, and I see a couple of poems by a soldier who committed suicide, and I look, I, it just blew me away. A soldier is committing suicide, and I thought about it, and I asked the editor, could you put me in touch with his mother, and he said, not really, it's privacy. I said, please. Well, I finally got in touch with what was his stepmother who put me in touch with his real mother and I called her. We talked a lot. She's a lot of crying. She's a wonderful woman. Wonderful woman. So I decided to write an article about her. 
after I wrote the article, I was really unnerved by thinking of a young man who had done a wonderful job as a soldier. Two tours of duty in a row. Two, yes, committing suicide. And I said, this is not right. I want to know more. So I began doing a lot of research, decided, because one of my passions in writing is human rights. And for me, this is a human rights book. So I started uh, doing a tremendous amount of research on both wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and also on our veterans and their families. Because who thinks of Cheryl, Noah's mother, and how she feels right now? You know? She said, I died too, in a way, she did. And then she talked about the way Noah came back. And Noah had 30 to 90 days in which he could get help. What did they give him? Sleeping pills. You give a young man sleeping pills who is under tremendous stress, has nightmares, hallucinations, and how difficult it is to come back from a war situation where you're working 24-7, you don't sleep well, you keep hearing the IEDs and the EFPs, explosively formed projectiles, or the RPGs, the, and, and uh, rocket-propelled uh, grenades um, all the time, and you keep seeing dead bodies, you're walking over dead bodies, you're carrying parts of your buddy's party, and then you come back and people say, gee, I lost my keys, I'm so stressed, I can't find my keys. And there's this, you feel like an alien. Nobody knows what you've been through, nobody cares. It is a volunteer army. Had, had we had a draft, we would be out of Afghanistan. Because? Because the country would be concerned and involved, and it's not. One percent, while 99 percent go shopping and watch TV. You talk about the story of Jeff Lucy and his yeah. parents, Kevin and Joyce, in Western yeah. Massachusetts. I remember meeting them, um, oh, it was two Democratic conventions ago in Boston. Uh, that's when they first, right around the time that they first lost their son, because he didn't commit suicide on the battlefields of no. Iraq or Afghanistan, but when he came home. That's a whole other issue, is when veterans come home, um, they have to readjust, they miss their buddies, they come home numb, because you have to be working constantly in combat. You can never allow yourself any time, and is there any time for mourning? One vet told me that they had so many fatalities that instead of having a service every time, it was Tuesdays and Fridays with a bunch of... So you're numb and you don't have time to mourn when you lose a buddy or time to feel terrible when you've seen children, dead bodies of children, or a time to feel anger. And for me, there's a tremendous um, intertwining of anger and grief which people don't realize and if you're in the military culture anger is more uh, acceptable than sorrow you're not supposed to feel sad we don't even have the word sadness in our we get depressed but sadness um, so here comes this young man Jeff changed he's not the Jeff he used to be his parents don't understand and like most veterans, they are in terrible pain, they have nightmares, so what do they do? They drink or they take drugs because it takes away the pain. And, okay, let's think about the health care that Jeff got. The VA does not do dual diagnosis. So here's poor Jeff, he's having suicidal thoughts, his parents don't know because they didn't tell his parents. And because he was heavy on alcohol, he was drinking a lot of beer, we can't treat you. We can't do a dual, they didn't say we don't do a dual not diagnosis. He said when he gets off alcohol, then we can treat him. That's no way to treat a veteran that comes home in terrible pain. Mm -hmm. And beyond Jeff's story, they are 
because of the